good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, I pray for this message, that this message truly would be a message that you, God, have for your people. May the proud amongst us be humbled, and may the humble be lifted up. In your name, amen. amen. So what we've been doing on Sundays and Wednesdays is kind of a sermon series actually on prayer. I no longer have a book to show you. They, they, they're all gone. But my hope is that everybody here got a book written by, o, by the way, his name I think is Ole, O-L-E, a good old Norwegian name, Ole. Don't you love just the name? If I had a son, I'd want to name him Ole. Can we do that? Can we do that? Right, girls, just the rest of my life. Which one of my girls can I nickname Ole? <laughs> uh, so Ole, Ole Hallisby is his name. He's a Norwegian Lutheran. Uh, he died in the 20th century, but he wrote a wonderful devotional on prayer. So my, pray my hope, my prayer is that you're reading this book. What we're doing on Sundays is taking one chapter, on Wednesdays another chapter, on Sundays another chapter, throughout this book, throughout this season. This is the season of Lent. Lent is a season within the church calendar of self-reflection. Where we are supposed to grow, we're supposed to go deeper all the time, but we reflect on where we've been missing it. Now, I'm going to be real honest and transparent with you. One of my greatest weaknesses in my Christian walk is actually prayer. That's why I chose this. Because I actually find prayer to be a difficult thing to do well. She's doing this intentionally. Look at this. She's standing her up so I can, she can look and laugh at me. But prayer is, yeah, no. Prayer is a difficult thing for me to do well. Uh, and so I just want to start just with this. Let's just ask a very simple question. What is prayer? What is it? Prayer, very simply, is conversation, communication with God, primarily through thoughts and words. That's what prayer is. Every single person that is a Christian, what do we do? Prayer is as vital to the life of the Christian as a heartbeat is to the life of the body. The simple fact of the matter is, if you are a Christian, then what do you do? You pray. It's that simple. And I know that you pray. You are here. You believe in Jesus Christ. You pray. But here's the reality. I actually find prayer difficult. I joke about it in a puppet show, but here's the truth of the matter. When I pray, it is intensely difficult for me to remain focused, for me to remain uh, single-minded on prayer. My mind veers away often. And in the past, and I do say in the past, in the very recent past, I would feel a tremendous amount of guilt. I would try and concentrate as hard as I could to make my prayers good. To try and have good prayers. And the simple fact of the matter is, I would often leave my time of prayer with what kind of feeling? With guilt. I would leave my prayer time with guilt because I didn't do it well enough. And I was right about one thing. I didn't pray good enough. Where I was wrong, and where I really hope you catch this today, is that your prayer life is not about you being good enough. It's not about you saying the right words. It's not about you believing strong enough in your prayers. Where I want to start is here. Why do you think your prayer life, or my prayer life, is so hard? So often you want your prayer life to be a time of peace, a time of rest, but very often it's a time of struggle. And I'm going to answer for you why that is. Because you, whether you recognize it or not, me, whether I recognize it or not, we're in a war. That's a simple fact. We are in a war. Now let me ask you a question. If you were a soldier in an army, and you were behind enemy lines, and you had secret communication with the general so that the general could tell you what to do on the battlefield, what do you think your enemy would try and do at all costs? Cut that communication. And that's exactly what, why prayer is such a difficulty. And sadly, sadly, why so many of us, to be perfectly honest with, uh, with you, why so many of our prayer lives are shallow, vacuous, and empty. Because we're in a war and we don't even recognize it. And a lot of times we give up on the very communication with the God that saves us. The Bible is very clear about our station in life. In Ephesians 6.12 it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Meaning our real enemy is not with people. How often we get mistaken by that, that we think that people are our real enemy. According to the Bible, people are not our enemy. 
We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against rulers. We wrestle against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's rough language. Have you ever heard the phrase spiritual warfare? Have you ever heard that before? This is where we get that, that kind of language. Because this is what happened. This world that we live in, is there any question who really rules this place? Let's just be honest. Of the 7 billion people on earth, and I'm just flying from the hip here, only a billion call on the name of Christ. Only a billion, a little over a billion. Of the 7 billion on the earth. That means six out of every seven humans that live right now do not call on the name of Jesus. Of those billion people, how many, we do not know, authentically believe in the Christ they call on? I think that's a much smaller number. How many of the people that live in this world live in prosperity, in health, in peace, and in happiness? How many? Very few. What usually rules this world is darkness, hate, greed, envy, pride, and lust. What makes money in this world is usually taking advantage of other people. Is that not true? Is there any question, therefore, who is it that's running this place? Jesus himself, when he references the devil, gives, G gives Satan a title. He calls him the prince and the power of the air. Now a prince, no mistake, has to answer to a king, but a prince still rules territory, does he not? And the prince of this world, the Bible says, is not you and me any longer. When God first created Adam and Eve, he gave Adam dominion over this world. But then Adam was tempted, wasn't he? And Adam dropped the scepter of this kingdom. And who picked it up? The devil himself. So we, whether you recognize it or not, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we become a child of God, we are now behind enemy lines. We are now soldiers in a fight that Satan is attacking against us. And if we understand that prayer is communication with our general, in order to get communication with him, is there any doubt what Satan wants to do more than anything else? He wants to stop, stifle, and destroy that communication. He knows better than us, sadly, how vital prayer is to our real spiritual life. So he will do anything that he can in order to destroy your life of prayer. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, he will do anything within his power to disrupt it. That's why it's so difficult to pray. Do you know that if it wasn't for prayers, not one Christian would have ever come to faith. Not one sick person would be healed. There would be no peace in this world if it were not for the prayers of Christians. So the simple fact of the matter is he wants to do anything he can to stop that prayer from happening. And one thing as an aside, today in liberal Christianity, people use the word Satan just to mean an old idea of evil. I don't mean it that way. I believe very strongly in that good old time religion that the Bible talks about. Satan is a real spiritual being. At his disposal is a third of the angels that were in rebellion against God. We now call them demons. And they are not in hell. Where is Satan and his demons? They are right here. And what they are trying to do is stop your communication with God. So make no mistake, whether you want to be in a war is inconsequential to it. You actually are in one. And prayer is a vital source of communication between ourselves and God. Now the saddest part of all this is, do you want to know what Satan's greatest ally and our difficulties in prayer are. What is Satan's greatest ally in disrupt, disrupting your and my prayer life? It's you and me. You are Satan's greatest ally. Because here's the thing. Whether you recognize this or not, the Bible talks about a war even going on inside of you. And it talks about it, the spirit versus the flesh. Now, when you and I in our common vernacular use the word flesh, we usually mean the skin on our bones, the muscles in our arms, the veins pumping through our bodies. That's not what the Bible means in this context by flesh. There is an ugly part of you. There's an ugly part of me. 
you recognize it and you know it. That ugly part of you is that part of you that woke up this morning without an hour worth of sleep, let's just be honest, and said, oh, I don't really want to go. Uh, that's that ugly part of you. There's that ugly part of you that honestly, every time you want to, that, that you say, I'm going to pray this time, that ugly part of you, guess what it doesn't want to do? It doesn't want to pray. There's that ugly part of you that doesn't want to play with the kids, that doesn't want to read those stories. There's that ugly part of you that looks at the whole world in reference to how it affects you. Well, how does my country affect me? How does my job affect me? How does my church affect me? There's that ugly, nasty part of you and that ugly part of me that looks at the whole thing and is constantly thinking about who? Themselves. The Bible terms that part of you the flesh, the sinful nature. And Jesus came and died to kill that part of you. And the Bible says that there is now hostility in the Christian because there's also a new part of you. There is a new part of you that does want to be here. There's a new part of you that does want to worship. There's the new part of you that does want to read the word of God. There's a new part of you that does love to pray. And even inside of yourselves, there's a battle, is there not? The Bible calls this the battle of the flesh versus the spirit. The Apostle Paul says this, But I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For, if, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. The simple fact of the matter is you have a new you that was created when you came to faith in Jesus. The Bible says that's the real you. That's the you that's going to live forever. That's the you that's going to live on the new heaven and the new earth for eternity. That old, disgusting, nasty you that doesn't want to pray, that doesn't want to read the Bible, that's selfish and greedy and hateful, that you, according to God, is really dead. But the Bible calls it the flesh, and it hangs on until you leave this place. And that's a war even inside of you. And Satan's greatest ally, Satan's greatest ally is the flesh. Because here's the simple fact of the matter. When you pray, you close your eyes, you pray, and you open your eyes, and you look around you, and what do you see? The same thing you saw when you closed your eyes. Satan attempts to tell your flesh that prayer is ineffective. Satan attempts to tell your flesh that you're no good at it anyway. You can't even pay attention. Satan attempts to tell your flesh, you know what? This is a pointless 10, 15, 20 minutes that you just had. You could have been so much busier. Is it not true that as soon as you get down to praying, you immediately think about all the tasks you have to do? You have to feed the kids. You have to do the laundry. You have to do this thing at work. You have to do this. You have to do that. This needs attention. And immediately when you sit down to praying, you think about the one million other things that you could be doing, even entertainment. Let's just be honest. I could be doing this thing. I could be doing that thing. Knowing this helps us understand our aversion to prayer. Haven't you ever noticed that doing holy things is always a struggle? It's always a struggle. Reading your Bible. Isn't that one of the most difficult things that you have to do? To just take your Bible, open it up, and read it. I talk to Christians all the time. They can't find 10 minutes to do that but they can find hours to watch their favorite television shows. Let's just be honest. Isn't it really hard to find the time to pray? Even worship, that's a hard thing, isn't it? Be honest. I got a question. If you, if you maybe you don't have a nine to five job and that's fine, of course, but just for the, for the sake of argument, pretend you have a nine to five job, okay? Uh, Monday through Friday, nine to five. Somebody says to you, can you do this thing Wednesday at 3, whatever this thing is? What do you say? You say no. Why? Because i got to work. i, I got to work. I can't do it. And that's really easy for you. There you find no struggle within that, do you? i got to work. But let someone invite you somewhere Sunday at 11. I'm serious. Let somebody invite you somewhere Sunday at 11. Well, yeah, I can do it. It immediately tells you, doesn't it, what the priorities in life have become. It immediately informs. The holy thing, which is worship, is what? 
It's a secondary thing. The thing that you would find no problem. Well, I got to work. I can't do it. Haven't you ever noticed that holy things are things, sadly, that you get to when you what? Have the time. They've ceased becoming a priority. Who do you think is behind this? Satan does not care if you have a job. Satan does not care if you work. As a matter of fact, he'd like you to work a lot to keep your mind distracted from any type of other, I think work is a holy thing, but other holy things. That's a simple fact of the matter. When you sit down to read your Bible, is that not when your cat wants to be fed? Is that not when the dog starts to make a ruckus? Is that not when the phone rings? Who, I'm, I'm being serious. You have to begin to think with this mentality. Who is it that's behind that? Anything at all to distract you from that, from the holy thing. Knowing this dichotomy helps because your flesh hates praying too. Your flesh hates holy things as well because your flesh is of the enemy, is of the old self. So you're right. If you are looking, if you are looking for a, a sermon where you simply say, well, in prayer is when I have the most peace, this is not it. Actually, I believe that in prayer, what are you engaging in every single time you pray? You're engaging in a fight. And the enemy knows just how important that fight is. And it's about time you and I, what? Get up to speed. And recognize how big of a deal this is. Now, I will tell you what the greatest ally you and I have. And it's an ally that I missed. And remember, I've been a pastor for 14 and a half years. I've been a Christian for 42. For some reason, I never made this connection. First, I shouldn't, <laughs> I did this as a 32, I should have told them. When I put explain in parentheses, that's a note to me. Uh, that's a note to me in my sermon. Uh, so forget the explain. As a matter of fact, VJ, get rid of that, man. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Get rid of that. Get, get rid of explain right there. That's the note telling me to explain this bullet point. Let's see him do it. He can do this. Come on, VJ. Ah! No, go back. What's happening? Ah! <laughs> Oh my goodness. Look, I asked, I ex explain, explain. Rosa did it. Explain this. Uh, explain it. Uh, all right, do we have this, VJ? I shouldn't even have asked you to do that. Look at it. What? Go for it. No. <laughs> make, make that last point uh, uh, an animation. It's the third animation. But anyway, so what I, <laughs> the first point is we are saved by grace. Not by anything that we do. All right? What I mean by that is this. Okay? Because I'm going to explain it now. Uh, <laughs> you and I, we have a relationship with God by nature that's hostile. All that greed, all that hate, all that anger that you have inside of you, that makes your relationship with God hostile. You can't get better. I already know this. Have you ever really tried to be a good person? Honestly. Like really hard. Like I'm going to really try this time. And every time you do it, hold on. I see those are supposed to flip. They're not supposed to just come, but we'll get there. That's fine. Uh, so just try and just pay attention to the first point. I'll never ask VJ to do one of these things again. <laughs> uh, you've tried really hard. And every single time you try hard, what happens? You fail. What I've noticed is, and what I could always understood, is that I understand that I'm saved by God's grace. Chris didn't make himself holy. Who made Chris holy? God did through his son Jesus. That's who made Chris holy. It was God that became a man. It was God that walked on water. It was God that raised the dead. It was God that cast out demons. It was God that did all of those things. Chris didn't do any of those things. What I never made a connection is this point number two. I know that I'm saved by simply the grace of God, not by anything Chris does. What I didn't connect to was that I pray by the grace of God, not by anything that Chris does. I always looked at my prayer life as something that Chris did. Like I hoe the garden or I cut the roses. I don't say God cut the roses. I don't say God tilled the garden. 
what I had to begin to do was apply God's grace to my own prayer life. Because the simple fact of the matter is, every single time I would pray, I would leave prayer feeling guilty. Because I didn't pray good enough, I veered away, I didn't think my prayers were powerful enough. And every one of those excuses, who am I focusing on? I'm focusing on Chris. I'm not focusing on the grace of God. When in actuality, every time I enter into prayer, I'm only entering into prayer because of God's grace. What I have to recognize is I thought prayer was a battle that I had to fight. I want to take an exorcism as an example. Let's just pretend you meet someone who's demon-possessed. And let's just pretend that you are gun- you're the exorcist. Is the battle between you and the demon, yes or no? If it is, you're in trouble. In Acts 19, there were seven sons of Sceva. Sceva was a Pharisee. And they thought they could cast out demons without believing in Jesus Christ. Does anybody know what happened to these seven guys in Acts 19? They got beat up, they got stripped naked, and they got thrown out of the house. If the battle is between you and a demon, guess who loses? You lose. But if the battle is between Jesus Christ and the demon, what happens? Jesus always wins. And here's the problem that I had. I thought the struggle in my prayer, Satan is attacking me, my flesh is attacking me. I thought the battle in my prayer life was what? Between me and my flesh, me and the devil. And I thought I was waging this war. When in actuality, the battle in prayer is not between Chris and the devil. What is it? It's between God and the devil. So when I pray, I pray in God's grace. What I mean by that is, you know what? Chris still tries hard. And when Chris veers away and thinks about bacon and thinks about, thinks about other things that Chris thinks about, I just simply at that moment ask God for forgiveness for nothing else than what? Than veering away. Lord, just forgive me. And then I get right back to the task. What's gone is my guilt. What's gone is my struggle. I'm not struggling any longer because the blood of Jesus Christ, if it washed over my lust, if it washed over my greed, if it washed over my pride, if it washed over all these other failures in my life, it also washes over that conversation. I don't try so hard to find the right words as if prayer was some kind of a trick. I just give God entrance into my heart. So this last point says, I shall find no rest and peace in prayer as long as I think that I, by the concentration of my own will, can keep my thoughts on God. That's from Hallersby. And I think he's absolutely right. I now actually do find peace in prayer because I recognize it's not about Chris trying hard anymore. It's about God just wanting to spend time with Chris. Do you see the difference in that mentality? That's all this is. It's just about God wanting to spend time with me. We should deal with this sin like we deal with all other sins. Lay it at Christ's feet. I don't know. A lot of people, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people. That's a lie. Some people like it. Some people don't like this book. It's been deeply helpful to me because unbeknownst to me, I mean, I knew there was something wrong is what I'm saying. That's why I chose the book. I knew there was something wrong in my prayer life. Uh, What I never recognized, going into this whole thing, I thought, all right, I'm going to learn some tips on how to what? Pray better. What I've learned and what was revelatory to me is it's just really about God's grace, just like every other aspect in my life. Now, in chapter 4, Hallisby does have some advice that I think is helpful. So tips on prayer. Make prayer a regimented, important time of your day and your week. Uh, have you noticed that things that are important, like, for example, the kid's school, you don't, in the back of your mind, say to yourself, I wonder if the kids can skip school tomorrow. What do you say? The kids have school tomorrow. And this is what time they have to show up. This is what time they go. You don't say in the back of your mind, unless you're ready to lose your job. You don't say in the back of your mind, I wonder if I can just skip work tomorrow. That's not what you say. You recognize that tomorrow, what? I got to go to work. What we as Christians have failed to do is make the holy moments, and by the way, I think our whole life is a holy moment, but you understand what I mean, regimented times. 
Saturday morning at 9 a.m. has become a sacred time to me. If you don't know what Saturday at 9 is, it's in your bulletin, but I understand we don't read those anyway. Uh, at Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. is a time of prayer. It's a prayer time. Usually it's just Michael, Saifu, myself, and Andre. But it is, uh, it's an invitation to everybody. This isn't some boys club. Uh, you're invited to come Saturday mornings at 9 and just pray with us for an hour. Just to make it a regimented time. So when people want an appointment, guess what I say at the very beginning? I can't meet what? Saturday at 9. Because what's happening Saturday at 9? I'm praying Saturday at 9. So to make prayer a regimented time, an important time of your day and your week. Here's another thing about prayer. Don't always speak. Take time to be quiet in prayer and simply listen and be attuned. Let Jesus bring to your mind the things for which to pray. Uh, Hallisby has an image that I thought was hilarious. I was in my office working on the sermon, and I guffawed. I just laughed out loud when I read it to myself. Uh, and this is what he says. Supposing you did this at the doctor's office. He's, ta he's talking about how we never take time to listen. Suppose that when, you, when your turn comes, you enter into his office. He offers you a chair. Then suppose that you sit down and begin to tell him about all your plans and troubles. And then when you have talked a long time, suppose you get up, bid a polite adieu, and leave. What would the doctor think? Well, that is hard to say, but most likely he would think that some demented person had been in his office by mistake. Uh, and I think that's a great way. You just walk into the doctor's office, sit down, what's wrong with you? Well, my leg hurts, this is really rough, this is bad, this is this, I got all these problems. I got all right, see you later. Uh, and then you just leave. Um, if you go to a doctor and you ask the doctor for some advice, if you're not a demented person, what do you do at that moment? You listen to what the doctor has to say. And the Bible makes it very clear in Psalm 139. This is what David is saying to God. What does he want him to do? Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. It's very hard to be led if you will not listen. So in times of prayer, yes, be silent. See what is brought up in your spirit. See what is brought up in your mind. And those things that are brought up in your spirit and your mind, pray about them. I am convinced that God will bring up a whole host of things. A whole host of things. I'm not talking about an audible voice in your ear. I'm talking about that sweet voice in your spirit that brings to your attention so much. And we need to take time to listen. Amen. God is good. All the time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Help us in our lives of prayer. Help us, Father, to simply depend on your grace. Help us recognize that even in our prayer life, it is about your grace and mercy. In the name of Jesus, amen. We now continue with our tithes and offerings.